Welcome everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for the Indigenous Storytelling, Truth Telling to Reconciliation. My name is Rhonda Spence and I will be your MC for today. Up next, I would like to welcome Elder Elsie Paul, who leads the Cookham Kisawatisawin Society, which is a group of Aboriginal women whose sights are set on reclaiming the traditional ways of Cookham's grandmothers of the past. Elder Elsie Paul will be leading us with a smudge and a prayer, and I kindly ask that you all remove your hats. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. The Elder taught me we, need, we all come from the spirit world. We came here with nothing but our spirit. When we leave, we're going to leave you with nothing with our spirit. So he says, you take your jewelry off when you're doing the cleansing ceremony because he said we don't want any obstruction when we're cleansing ourselves with the medicines, you know. So I always uh, take my um, my jewelry off. And uh, I can't take this uh, my ring off here. It's really tight because my arthritis now. But the elder had said it's okay if you can't take your wedding ring off because that was a sacred ceremony. And besides, it's a circle, he said. You know, the circle is sacred. We light the medicines to the easterly direction. We go to the south, the west, and the north. Uh, we light the matches to the easterly direction first. And I'm using sage. And he said, light this on the four directions. And that's what I'm doing right now. And for me, I like smudging my hands because our hands are so powerful. They're, they're, we're so creative with our hands. But we're also powerful with our hands. We can hurt somebody with our hands. So I always like smudging my hands extra more. And we go like this, the elder said. And we go this way. And we also are going to cleanse our eyes. So we're cleansing our eyes so we're going to see good in people. And if we can condition ourselves, when we look at somebody, we can condition ourselves to look like we're looking at the Creator, you know. And so he says, the ears, you cleanse your ears too. We're not going to bother listening to cursing and gossiping, you know. So we cleanse our ears and our mouth. So we're not going to bother cursing and gossiping or saying negative things. And we're also going to smudge our hearts. So we're going to be blessed with kindness, gentleness, and love. So, but anyway, I'm going to say my prayer now. He says, in my language, I I know that we nam stay in Moscow, na no man of Skagi Skag. Me na mat sunochte, guan taski na no tski na skum na wahu tu enochte. I he into asum sna na gochte, no sim na na gochte. Me wahu magen na na ni gani tawi taksun tski guan mochte ma kina skum na no hum na na mi nochte, ni musum na na ni gihu na na mi nochte. Thank you, Creator, for today. We thank you for life. We thank you for our land. We thank you for kinships, our children, our grandchildren, and our future generation that's coming in the future. We thank, we thank you for that. Thank you for grandmothers and grandfathers. And we thank you for, for friendships. Be with us to be together in a good way, Creator. Help us to look at each other in a good way, to speak together in a good way, and that we're going to work together in a good way, Creator. We just thank you for everything. Hi, hi, Marcy, thank you. Thank you, Elsie Paul, for the smudge and prayer. Next up, I would like to welcome Adrian Lachance. Adrian is a Plains Cree, originally from James Smith Cree Nation. He has faced many challenges in his life, from addiction to the child welfare system and incarceration. Through reconnecting with his culture and the elders for many years, he has been on his healing journey. And he is here today to sing the honor song for us. Thank you, Adrian. Hi, hi. <laughs> Oh, 
Thank you, Adrian, for that beautiful honor song. Next, we welcome our guest speaker, April Eve Weiberg. April is from the Miccosu Cree First Nation and the founder of the Stolen Sisters and Brothers Action Movement, which is a grassroots movement created in response to the missing, murdered, and exploited Indigenous people to take action, raise awareness, and support families and survivors. April Leaf, thank you so much for being here tonight with us and uh, to be able to uh, share your experience and as well as uh, being part of the documentary premiere. I want to offer this eagle feather to you with all the hard work that you have been doing with the Stolen Sisters and Brothers Action Movement. You have been the forefront and you have brought us a lot of awareness. So I want to thank you for that and thank you for being part of my life. You have brought a lot to me. So thank I you. want to offer this to you with all the good work that you've done. Thank you so much. Hi, hi. Thank you. I love you. It's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, try not to cry. So beautiful. Thank you. Oh, Tanse, hello everybody. It is a real honor to gather here with you all today. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that our people have been here on Turtle Island since time immemorial. Our languages, governments, civilizations all developed here. I'm so very honored to be your guest speaker today. I would like to thank Elder Elsie Paul for your prayer and blessings, to Adrian for your honor song, and to Bernadette and the Creating Hope team for bringing us the vignettes of Elder Elsie, Cookham Kathy, Lana, Elizabeth, Jay, Bert, and Dolores. My name is April Eve. I'm a proud mother of two brilliant and beautiful children, Kimi Mila and Okichitao. I'm a member of the Miksu Cree First Nation Treaty 8. I'm also the founder of the Stolen Sisters and Brothers Action Movement, raising awareness and taking action on the human rights crisis of missing, murdered, and exploited Indigenous peoples. The humble beginnings of the very first Stolen Sisters Awareness Walk began 13 years ago, here in Amiskwachiwas Kahigan, Edmonton, and was the first walk in the province of Alberta, specifically raising awareness for the disproportionate number of missing and murdered Indigenous, Métis, Inuit, First Nations, and non-status women and girls. The movement itself is entirely grassroots, therefore does not seek funding from any government, business, or individuals. For centuries since European contact, Indigenous women, girls, gender diverse, men and boys, have been murdered or have been exploited and gone missing without a trace. These individuals all deserve justice, and many of their families are in critical need of answers and opportunities towards healing. I cannot emphasize more the importance and urgency of sharing our stories in culturally safe, loving, and non-judgmental spaces, like today's Indigenous storytelling. I believe that sharing our truths is paramount in the advancement of our well-being, along with our communities and our families. It wasn't until just a few years ago, I began to uncover my own deep personal connection to the MMIWG crisis. It wasn't until after the TRC hearings wrapped up 
but I began to learn the untold stories of my mother and other family members who survived the Indian residential schools. It wasn't until my own family members testified at the National Inquiry's hearings that I began to truly understand the ripple effects of how losing our loved one to murder could impact our family. And it wasn't until my own testimony as a survivor of violence and sexual exploitation did I finally face what I had feared the most, my truth. My truth was my shame and the silence nearly killed me. I was literally drowning in trauma. At the age of 19, I was targeted, groomed, and then sexually exploited. In Canada, the average age of a sexually exploited youth is from the ages of 11 to 14 years old, with the life expectancy of seven years due to disease, suicide, and murder. I've known violence my whole life, but today I know that it wasn't my fault, nor the fault of my family. What happened to me and to so many others is a result of the impact of colonialism on Indigenous communities and the intergenerational effects of residential schools. I want everyone to know who's watching today and beyond that your story has value and that sharing your story in safe spaces can be so liberating and can inspire others to no longer suffer in silence. Seek opportunities to indigenize spaces. Be a resource by inserting your expertise as one of those who have been directly impacted by the crisis of missing murdered indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse. The road to healing, truth, and justice can be long and tiresome. Today, you may hear sensitive subject matter. It may impact you today or in the days ahead. I encourage everyone that after watching today's program, that you decompress by practicing self-care. This can be done by having a good smudge, having a bubble bath, going for a walk, or all of the above. Surround yourself with those who enrich your life and support your dreams. If you haven't done so already, help take action by familiarizing yourself and those you love with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 Calls to Action, as well the National Inquiry's 231 Calls for Justice. These are legal imperatives and represent ways to help end the genocide against our people and transform harmful, systemic and societal values that have worked to maintain colonial violence. Without the support of our fellow family members, and survivors, advocates and allies, the Stolen Sisters walks would never have continued or evolved past 2007. Please keep the families and survivors in your prayers and let us not forget that our men and our boys are suffering too, and they too need our support. Through sharing our stories, we are helping Canada come to truth. As we forge ahead as a community, addressing racial injustice. May Creator keep us safe and remind us of our inherited resiliency. Through the love and strength of our ancestors, we have kept alive our diverse spirituality, languages, arts, sciences, and rich, rich culture against all odds. I look forward to seeing you all in community. Hi, hi, Kanana Skompton all my relations. I want to thank them, the offering of the tobacco, because, you know, this is not for personal use. It's what meant for for prayers and offerings, and that's one of the teachings we need to teach the younger generation. Once they start learning about their culture, traditions and values and spirituality, they put themselves in a safe journey. We need to journey back and find out how our people lived here for thousands of years before European contact, because the culture 
and the spirituality kept our journey in a healthy way. I learned the little children were taught right from birthing, zero to 14 years old, they were taught. And they had a sense of belonging and a sense of that they were cared for and they were looked after and they were well respected. I found out even our people consider the little kids little elders. So when you raise children in that healthy way, in that spiritual way, right from the start, they're careful of what kind of journey they're on. They don't put themselves in danger. The more I learn about our old way and the more I go to sweat lodges, ceremonies and stuff like that, the more I was able to overcome these things that I used to do that could have put me in such a dangerous situation. I'm lucky that I'm still alive. I truly believe that we have to teach the younger generation the old way. And I can't say enough of that. I'm sober today. I don't have a lot of fear. I don't feel uncomfortable. I'm not embarrassed the way I used to be, you know. I feel so good in my own skin. And that's because culture always, you know, and the ceremonies and stuff like that. That's what makes me who I am. And that's why I teach my grandchildren and the younger generation, you know, the culture. It's so important that we connect them back to the old way, the way our people lived here for thousands of years, you know, because once you know your culture, you're not going to put yourself in danger. And our people put themselves in danger. It's not their fault. They just didn't have an opportunity to learn the traditional way of life. And when we teach our First Nations children what a beautiful culture they come from, they're going to start feeling better and better. They're going to feel good in their own skin. And that's how I feel. I feel good. I truly believe in culture. And I want to stay like that because it got me off drugs and alcohol. It got me off the street. I cannot say enough about the reconnection to culture, how beautiful it is. But once we learn, we have to teach the younger generation so it doesn't repeat and they're able to be teachers and educators. And I have my little seven-year-old great-granddaughter. I was at a meeting with her, and that's what she told the people there. The education never stops. It goes from generation to generation. As a mother and grandmother, a sister, a daughter, and an aunt, I think it's important to teach our, our daughters, our granddaughters, our nieces, our relatives to stay safe. Beyond being safe is being in a place of courage and intelligence of knowing uh, the spaces you're going into. And so when you think of creating safety, it's about, it's about walking with your courage and your ancestral intelligence and wisdom. You know, as a square walk, we are given some pretty strong gifts as, as women and as mothers and grandmothers that we need to reconnect to those, those powers we are given. Also help nurturing that uh, ancestral power in others. Being connected to that awareness of the spaces we go into, of the people we're surrounded with being in a place of courage before being in a place of safety. We can never guarantee safety for others, but we can always be in a place of courage for ourselves. Looking at all the historical adversities that we, we've come from, as well as all the resilience that we've come from, the more information we can provide our younger generation, our next generation, about where they come from, that includes those traditional values, it includes the hard uh, stories that are listened to and have those hard conversations. We build um, courage within them. If we can give them as, a, as our grandmothers and, and our knowledge keepers and elders all the best that we can give them, we're instilling in them courage so that when they are walking in beauty into these places, they are creating that safe space for themselves. I think it's very important when we're teaching children to be safe, to have safety in relationships and respect for themselves and respect in relationships, to very much lead from example. So when children are young, they may share to a parent, they may share to a friend, they may share to a, a teacher 
or someone in a trusted position about things that are happening to them. Just providing, I guess, children the space to have their stories heard and to listen to them and believe them when they come forward with these stories because they look at parents, at teachers, at aunties, grandparents as their pillars of safety. And I think um, when we start from such a young age not believing children, when they come forward with their truths, we're really setting up a cycle for unhealthy relationships. So I think trusting our children and and their experiences and what they know is a very important stage uh, for teaching children about relationships. And I think even alongside that comes teaching about consent. And, you know, this can be a vague kind of concept or, or thing to think about teaching our children. I mean, even when we think about hugging, when we think about things that kind of can be taken for granted as, uh, as a common occurrence when children are pulling away from those things or asking, you know, for that not to happen. Teaching about consent comes from a very young age. And so when we respect children's boundaries and the sacredness of their body and their ability to tell older people, to tell their friends, to tell their loved ones, you know, when and how they would want to be touched or loved, I guess, is instilling that from a very young age. Why it's important to not let, I guess, children carry these kind of secrets or to to live with their experiences in shame. I think knowing people very close to me and in my work as well with people who have experienced trauma and with people who have been shamed into silence, whether that's because of violence in their family, physical violence, sexual violence, fear about any kind of real perceived shame upon the family, just what that can do to a person and carrying those thoughts and not being able to put one's experiences, one's feelings, one's heart out there to have people come in and be able to hold you and support you in that can do such, I would say, ravaging damage to a person on so many levels, whether that's how one can get stuck in their thoughts and be replaying, this is my fault, this person's fault, and all this kind of blame. But also in the physical realm, watching one person that I cared about who went through that experience of not having their story believed by those closest to her uh, throughout her life, just developing some very severe physical health illness. And I think this idea of believing children, believing women, believing our friends, when we turn them away or we say that didn't happen to you, you're lying, or, you know, I know this person and they wouldn't do that. It's just creating this space of shame and destroying, I guess, that trust, trust that somebody would be there to help. And I think it can be so easy to do that because we love people or we see what we might see on the surface. But just really believing people's experiences, I think that is my strongest message I I would have. Um, So my relationship with missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is uh, pretty intergenerational. I've had some aunties um, and some great aunts who've experienced a lot of violence, but I've also um, I have uh, cousins who have been murdered. Um, and so my, my relationship to this is very intergenerational. As like women and girls and marginalized genders, we are just simply existing. And that's oftentimes when we experience the most violence. We need to be undoing a lot of the patriarchal systems and actually having consequences for when uh, men hurt us and having a justice system in place that protects us, having a police force that actually investigates the violence and the harm and the murder we go through. I don't think the onus should be on us to stay safe because we are just simply existing when this violence happens. What I have to say to other two-spirit, indigenous, non-binary, gender fluid, trans uh, folks, specifically indigenous folks, is that no matter what, we are, we're still here and we are who we are and that we are always going to be in relationship with ourselves, 
and there's so much to fight for. And I think the future is particularly bright with all of us there. To practice self-care in a time of grief and mourning is hard because every minute is hard to experience and live through. So the best thing I suggest is to breathe through it and recognize that loss is inevitable. And it's unfortunate that indigenous people like ourselves experience such a high rate of loss but to remember that we have loved ones beside us. We have a wide community and we have a bunch of people who are always going to be rooting for our success, our life, our love, and what we do tomorrow. Healing isn't linear. There are going to be easy days and there are gonna be hard days, but to take baby steps, I know it sounds redundant, but you never think you're going to heal until you realize one day that you are in a better place than you were before. And it's just about making sure that you are taking care of yourself and making sure that you are okay. That means like drinking more water or like making sure you eat. That's all important to making sure that your family and your unit grow together. I think that support is uh, definitely nuanced in regards to how they get support. When um, my family was particularly going through a rough patch a couple years ago, there was a lot of um, public scrutiny and that was mostly because of racist uh, commenters on Facebook and uh, CBC and APTN. And it really showed us that the support we needed was from our whole community and from the wider community. And I think we saw very similar things with Colton Bushy and Tina Fontaine is um, the support that is needed is much more than what the justice system in Canada can provide. The child welfare system is linked to the missing and murdered. I was at a gathering recently, just a few days ago, where some of the settler women were asking me questions. One of the women that really asked me, like, she just, like, she's so heartfelt question. She asked me, she said, what can we, she said, as settler people, what do we need to do to end the missing and murdered? And she said, or at best, reduce it. And I said to her, stop stealing our children. Every time you take our children away, you're ripping out our hearts and souls. And those pieces are really, really hard to put back together. Some parts of us never get back, put back together. I witnessed my mom going through absolute hell, absolute torture as a mother because my younger siblings kept being taken away from her. There is no support systems for my mother to parent. But one thing I did notice was that every time my mom's children, my siblings, were returned to her and taken away from her, I witnessed pieces of her heart going with her every time. And every time my, my siblings were returned to our mom, our mom had a harder and harder time to even try to parent, and her drinking got from bad to worse. My mom's oldest son was her fourth child, my younger brother. He died, he was run over, hit and run in BC. Three cars ran over him before anybody realized there was a human body on the road, so we had a closed casket. He didn't even live to see 25. That was the turning point for her where she just started to give up more and more and more. And she ended up turning to a lot of men, extremely abusive men. So it's, it's that accumulated trauma. That accumulated trauma of taking away our children. Is this the day that I'm going to get that phone call that my grandchildren have been taken away again? I had one grandbaby died in foster care. She'd be seven years old this year. And as a result, my oldest daughter, who had been five, six years sober at that point and doing really well in her recovery, two years down the road, she was right back, right back in the gutter within herself. Back in the fall, she messaged me at two in the morning. She was hiding in the closet just to try and stay alive. The man that was in her life at that time was trying to kill her. 
you know, and, and, and those are the situations, not, not blaming, not blaming anyone, but when the pain is so great that the parents of the children who are taken away from them turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol, turn to abusive relationships. When I was on the streets with a lot of the young, young women, we were girls on the streets, we had dreams. We dreamt about putting our little kids through college, university, having a house. I don't ever remember anyone saying, oh, I want a big mansion or drive around in a Cadillac. <laughs> it was all about, I don't want my kids to grow up in foster care the way I did. And uh, a lot of those women I was young with are gone. A lot of them never stood a chance. And a lot of them never even got to see their children. There ha is another way other than just ripping children away from us. Last August, I went and took my older granddaughters from their mom and took them to, uh, to their auntie. And we had a family get together. And I said to both my daughters, I said, we're going to do this the Nihia way. No child welfare, no government involvement. It's just going to be us, the three of us. We're going to pull together and do what we can to keep these girls in the family this time because they're in foster care for three years and it took us a long, long time to get them back. Thank God for creating hope. If they hadn't advocated for us, <laughs> my granddaughters that have grown up spend the rest of their days in out of foster care. So like those are the kinds of things we need to do and, and we need to do that with a help from those people who came up with the policies of taking our children away from us. And I'm so glad that some groups of people, like the United Church people, are, are so willing to work with us and coming to us and asking us, well, what is it that we need to do different? And that's the thing, it's about doing things different, not doing things better, but doing things different. I think we can teach them about healthy relationships. In order for them to have a healthy relationship, they need to know who they are. They need to know what the, the kind of things that they like and the kind of things that they don't like, what they will tolerate and what they can't. I remember a specific teaching, teachings that I received from Elder Jerry Saddleback in Muscogee about how relationships were done before colonization. He told us that when women were looking for a partner, they had to date each other or be in a relationship for four years. And that first year, there would be no touching between the partners. They would be able to talk, but they would always be in the presence of their parents or in the presence of an elder. And the second year of their relationship, at that time, they would be able to hold hands. They'd still be under supervision of an elder or somebody older than them, but they would be able to be a little bit closer uh, physically. In that four years, there was no intimacy that ever happened. It helped so that in those four years, if they decided that they didn't want to be together anymore, then they could separate and there wouldn't be any children that were left behind. There wouldn't be anybody else to think about except for in their relationship. Nowadays, though, women or even young girls don't always do that. They, they rush head in for head first into their relationships and then codependency begins to happen because they don't know who they are as women. They don't have an idea of who they can be or what's possible for them, especially at young ages. I think that we can help young women and girls choose healthy partners and be in healthy relationships. Like I said, we can teach them who they are. For example, there's some specific teachings, you know, that you get when you're a young girl about how to raise a family. We call them moon time teachings, right? You're taught these from the very first beginning when you get your moon time because at that point, you're able to bring forth life. So in order for you to see the kind of person that you're gonna become, will depend on whether or not you get those teachings. Like I've said, it, it changes the kind of person that you're gonna be for young women. I also think we can teach them by letting them know that they're special, letting them know that who they are isn't dependent on somebody on what somebody else tells them that they are. How they can choose healthy relationships is by modeling that for them. Making sure that we are doing 
what we are telling them. So if we're telling them, okay, well, you need to be respectful of your body. You need to be exemplifying that as well. This is what we're trying to tell you because we do it also. We tell them, you know, that in order for you to have a good relationship, you can't be drinking or you can't be doing this and that. Sometimes we don't always exemplify for them what that is. I think if we want them to have healthy relationships, we need to we need to be able to teach them and show them what that is, especially the showing. I think a big thing about healthy relationships and trying to teach other people about it is to recognize that we're all on a journey together. I myself didn't enter many healthy relationships until very recently when I began to realize that communication is important. And that means having the hard conversations. That means making space to investigate and hold so many other nuances, your partner's nuances. And it's difficult when so many of us are healing and coping with intergenerational trauma. I believe there definitely needs to be spaces and like safety nets for when we stumble and when we fall and that it's not the end. Good day. My name is Bert Bull from uh, Muscatese, Blue Bull Tribe. The topic of a uh, missing murdered women you know, that was unheard of long ago. What happened along the way for a human to steal and take another human's life away? Who gave that human the right to a uh, go higher than creator? What value of life did that other human have? The value of a uh, self-love was not there and did not believe in themselves. We were affected from day one, from the first contact. The different people came from across the big water. We were deprived of everything. They also brought a, a behavior that was learned to do great harm. But we were uh, resilient in our own way to survive. So when it comes to missing and murdered women, what happened along the way? How much were they shown to value their lives, to be safe? Se manto isigo, our creator. When we open our hearts, we meet creator halfway. How are we going to show the way to everybody else that we care about? From the heart. We are all messengers to a story of life. Maybe one day we'll have an answer of what was the reason for another human taking our life. But what do we need now to find within our hearts to a uh, move forward in life? We allow things to stop us. But like I said, with that warrior spirit, we're always resilient. We just need to come together. And I believe the power of prayer, the power of ceremonies, Creator alone us everything. This morning we got up, opened our eyes. We seen life. That's another blessing. We got up, prepared for today. We still have that ability to move our bodies. Keep learning the story of life to learn the value of your life. Self-love and belief. We shouldn't overshadow our heart. When we open our heart and learn to feel it, it'll never lie to us. It'll never lie to us and it'll uh, always tell us the truth. When you learn to fall in love with you, not sexual. When you learn to fall in love with you, hey, wow, this is me. One of a kind, beautiful, awesome human being. And that's who we have to believe in. 
So once we understand that, well, that's part of moving forward in life. And that's a part of why how we become that storyteller, a messenger to whoever needs it. Long ago, I used to be going down to, from the great grandparents to the parents, to us parents now, to our children, to our grandchildren, great grandchildren, and to the unborn. The spirit of that intent is continuous. But the only one that will stop it is, a, is human. The spirit will always be alive. We need to come together in a good way. Maganaskuman, you know, I thank you very much for allowing me to uh, share what little I know. But, uh, let's do it together. Hi, hi. My name is Delois Gladue, and I did this project for Korean Hope Society. Uh, when Bernadette first asked Michelle for me this project, I said, go into the mountains. When I come back, I'll give you an answer. And I thought about it in the mountains. I had to really think and think about, can I do this and be able to put my heart into it, but at the same time, be able to do this with a clear head. It was hard. I'm not going to lie and say it's been easy because it hasn't been easy. I come from a family where my aunt was murdered in 1988 and again in uh, 2015, my cousin Gloria went missing and murdered. So, And reading that final report, I don't know how many times I put it down in anger, thinking how dare you non-Indigenous people think of us this way? Because we're caregivers, we're life givers, we have a purpose in life, we are not the way that final report labeled us as. I said, we need our men to come home. And my elder and I have talked about that. And it's not only a woman's responsibility to stop the missing and murdered indigenous women. We can tell each other, we can support each other, but we need our Napiwak as well too, to take care of us women. Because traditionally, our men would have taken care of us women. They were our warriors. And our warriors got caught up with residential school and horizontal violence, so they become the perpetrators. They become abusers. And so for me, that was really hard to read because given my aunt and my cousin, you know, in 30 years carrying that around and finally putting that to rest with this project, and now with my, aunt, my cousin Gloria. Why this project is important, I didn't undertake this project for myself. It was to hopefully keep one woman alive. If we can't, you know, I'll never get my cousin Gloria back and I'll never get my auntie back. If I can save one of our school walk from miss, going and missing and murdered, then I've done my job. And what I've learned from this project is just, you've got to honor your yourself. You've got to honor your tears. You've got to support your tears. If they need to fall, let them fall need to cry, then cry. That is why we have tears. As Elsie Paul had once given me a teaching about water, that's why we have tears, because they are there to come out when they need to, when there's nothing wrong with that. And it's one thing my elder teaches me too. It's okay to cry. But I've taught myself to cry. And my mom's saying is, if a tree doesn't bend, it'll break. And it's okay to ask for help. You know, we don't have to go through life being this um, matriarch all the time, because even matriarchs cry. But at the same time, it takes, you know, a warrior to stand beside a matriarch. That's my opinion. And one thing that I've learned through this project is stuff that I want to teach my little granddaughter, my little Madison, you know, the stuff that I didn't learn. And I didn't have those healthy grandparents that I wish I would have had. And my mom did what she could in teaching me as well. So we're not all put on this earth to to fix everything. We're just here as pieces of the puzzle. I'm glad I did this project in honor of my cousin and my aunt. And I'm grateful that I'm able to hopefully, you know, keep one of our school work alive. 
based on what we put together and our resource book. I realize this is not an easy project to talk about. We don't want to talk about our women missing and murdered, but it needs to be spoken about because if we don't have the conversation, it's never going to end. I'm so grateful to the people that have wrapped their arms around me, Bernadette and Bert, my boys, Elijah, Kane, Joshua and Cole, my cousin Josie, friends I made along the way, Robin and Heather and Suzanne. I'm grateful for them, ladies, too. And I think that's all I have to say, but yeah. So this project is dedicated to the Iskulwak, all nations, and also the ones that missed. Now, I would like to introduce Bernadette Ayatel, the Executive Director and Co-Founder of Creating Hope Society. She will be doing our closing remarks. I want to also thank everyone for joining us today. It has been a great honor and pleasure to be your MC for such an important matter. All my relations. Hi, hi. What an amazing afternoon this has been. Thank you for participating in our premiere, Indigenous Stories, Truth Telling to Reconciliation Vignettes. First of all, I want to thank Creator for allowing me to be here today. Two years ago, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls report came. We were influenced by the 200 plus recommendations. There were over 1,484 family members and survivors who provided testimonies. Some families and specific recommendations on child welfare, domestic violence, intimate partner violence resulting in death, and holistic healing strategies. Healing our families and communities is the utmost important aspects that needs to be continued. We must continue to tell and speak about the truth, voice our thoughts, share our hurts, shed our tears, and stand together. Let us continue supporting grassroots organizations and events such as Memorial March of Edmonton Missing Indigenous Women. Let us continue supporting grassroots organizations and events such as Memorial March of Edmonton Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, the Moose Hide Campaign, Stolen Sisters and Brothers Action Movement, Sister in Spirit Vigils, and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Honoring Awareness Day. There are so many people that I want to thank. And to begin with, I'd like to thank Elder Elsie Paul for her wonderful smudging ceremony and her prayers. I want to thank Adrian for the honor songs. Special thank you for the MC Rhonda Spence and our guest speaker, April Eve Whitberg. You both worked so hard to bring awareness about our missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls plus. Thank you for all who shared on the vignettes. Elsie Paul, Kathy Hamlin, Peggy Nipus, Jay Simpson, Elizabeth Carlson, Bert Bull, Lana Whiskey Jack, and Dolores Gladio. You gave us vital teachings and messages. Thank you, Dolores Gladio, for coordinating the project. It was a challenging initiative because we at Creating Hope Society have lived experience of our own missing and murdered relatives and participants. While facilitating our fo focus groups, many stories were heartbreaking. We must continue to pray and acknowledge all who are victims of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls plus. Pray for the healing for the families and communities who are impacted of the loss of their loved ones. Thank you, Akira Aitel, for directing and editing the vignettes and Joseph Aitel to assisting director and sound director. Thank you, Shafe and the city, connecting the past. Ingrid Schaefer, alpha of the pack, without your expertise, I wouldn't know how to set up a virtual platform, so thank you. Thank you, Status A Woman of Canada, for funding Indigenous story, truth-telling, and reconciliation. Vignettes.
Just in closing, Creating Hope Society has developed a Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Plus Resource Handbook for Edmonton and area. This resource booklet is for all who are seeking guidance. With this, thank you, all my relations. Stay COVID free, keep your distance, and wear your face mask. Hi, hi. Amatakias.